You do surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother knew the lady in the picture and always said everyone knew Mrs. Sanderson because she always wore long skirts and Mr. Sanderson actually had an art shop in Richmond um, which was in Frenchgate in Richmond and, and sold easels and paints and the like. Um, I guess to all the artists who converge on Richmond to do paintings of the castle and yes. the surrounding district. The actual medium is watercolour and body colour and the body colour gives more weight to the paint. And I can think you can see this quite clearly, the way that the structure and the forms are built up, regardless of the folds in the dress, are built up in a hatching, cross-hatching way, a diagonal way. Even here, just away from the dress, you can see the way that it is built up very carefully. But when one comes away and outside the main figure, kind of halo effect round, uh, around her, you will see that the outside of the picture, the buildings and the pan here are expressed in more conventional style. Now the Italians in the 19th century um, devised a, this particular technique and they were called divisionists. I think it's possible, I think it would be good to look at the um, label on the back because the painting has been kept in its original frame and doesn't look as if it's actually been taken out of the no. frame ever. And here's the label here with the Darling, Darlington Society of Artists, the subject, the washing day, the original price, and then the artist's name and address. Now, it's a little bit difficult to uh, fix a price on it, especially as it's a local artist, and I think it's probably a rather unusual painting, probably uh, a kind of a one-off in many ways, but I would imagine that um, it would be worth something in the region of... Um, a thousand to fifteen hundred pounds. I don't know I'm what sure that my, seems to you. My grandmother would have been absolutely thrilled. Delighted, yes. Yeah. Hmm. Put those down there. Look at these. Well, these are three very pretty and, in fact, beautiful plates. Actually, I'd love to find out where you found them or how you acquired them, where they inherited. Well, they're inherited from my grandfather. Yes. Uh, he collected them, and it was one of his hobbies. Mm. Well, he got some nice examples here. I mean, if you're starting with this, which is actually a coal port plate, rather in the, the Welsh manner, uh, it's a very pretty thing, um, and that's probably worth, say, £100. Um, this is a very pretty plate here. Um, do you know what this is? No, no nothing look, at look all. Look at the back, and you see Chelsea, Chelsea red anchor yeah. mark, so it's mid-18th century. English porcelain plate from the Chelsea factory, moulded in rather the Meissen style, and beautifully painted. There are some minor imperfections here, but yeah. it's actually like pull the value down a bit. But that's probably probably would fetch something in the order of 450 to 550 pounds. Um, this plate here is quite the most sumptuous thing. I would hazard a guess it may be even one of the most beautiful pieces of continental porcelain we've had in the Antiques Roadshow. Mm. It doesn't take you know, a great expert to see the incredible quality of painting. No. Do you know what factory it is? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. It. No. Well, in a way, it's, 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 a German, it's a German porcelain factory of Nymphenburg. Um, turning it round here, you will see the mark. There's a sort of impressed mark of a shield, which is yeah, actually the yeah. Bavarian shield. These plates were, were probably met, come from um, the, the service which was made for the electoral court. Um, now, they are wonderfully painted by a man called uh, Joseph Zeckenberger, who specialized in doing these superb botanical subjects and marvelous insects, and also a sumptuous gilding. Now we get on to the business of, of what one thinks it's worth. Um, it's nice that sometimes one can be fairly precise. In this particular example, I do happen to know that two plates from this service uh, came up for auction in Geneva, where they generally they sell very yeah, well in that yeah. particular location. Uh, do you know any idea what you reckon they made? None no idea. So. <laughs> do you want to hazard a guess? Oh, thousand. Well, you're a little bit on the conservative side. You know, one made last year the equivalent of eight thousand pounds. Oh, <laughs>
we seem to have a, a fabulous copy of uh, a first edition of Tolkien's The Hobbit. So let's investigate. Now, the first thing I want to see is the condition of the dust wrapper. Um, it's a little bit chipped, but I don't think particularly badly for its age. Um, first edition freaks, I'm afraid, really insist on dust wrappers. It, they are rare. People used to take them off and uh, lose them and all that sort of thing. So it is quite important for a first edition of this quality to have a dust wrapper. Um, the binding seems to have uh, weathered reasonably well. A little bit of dust staining at the top and the bottom of the spine um, and a little round the edge. But generally, I mean, there's no tearing of the cloth or anything like that. So again, full marks there. Nearly full marks there. <laughs> Eight out of ten there, shall we say. Um, and then a complete knockout. Two things that knocked me out. One, a magnificent letter from Tolkien, signed Ronald. But two, sticky tape at the top. Now that is a thing that you must never do, never ever do. I'm not saying that you did it or, or, or anything like that, but people did this sort of thing, is tack interesting bits of information in the front of books. But you should never ever use sticky tape. Look, at the back of this you can see it all comes off and actually sticks into the paper and it's incredibly difficult to get out. In fact, it stains the paper completely. So, here, wonderful letter, my dearest Jane, here is a copy of my little book which I send you with much love, and so on and so on. And I hope it will amuse you. Your loving Ronald. Now, who is Jane? Do you know, is this a family? I'm not certain who Jane is, mm -hmm. but I know that it's a distant relative. I, I believe it was an aunt of J.R.R.'s. So you are, you are related to the Tolkien's? Well, by marriage. My husband by marriage. is um, J.R.R.'s grandson. Turning over to the front free end paper, I see another signature here for Auntie Jane from Ronald. I assume Ronald, I mean J.R.'s, uh, J.R.R.'s mm -hmm. um, uh, Aunt Jane. Right. And Simon Tolkien? Yes, that's my husband. He, the book came to him when the library, when J.R.R.'s library was broken up um, when he died. Yes. Simon was about 10, so they thought that um, The Hobbit would be the most appropriate book for him to have out of that because it was a children's book. Yes, yes. Well, The Hobbit, as you know, was written in, what, 1937, 1937, mm -hmm. um, and it was the first book. It heralds the, his famous trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. which everybody knows about. Right. And so, really, this is, this is Tolkien's first famous book. Now, there's one other point about a first edition of uh, this book. Let me take the book out. This is for dust wrapper freaks. Um, Tolkien, in fact, corrected this dust wrapper himself, or at least it is said that he corrected it himself. Mm -hmm. There is a mistake on these two notes, or on one of these notes on the end papers here. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've ever noticed it before. No, I haven't. Well, it is a point. Dodgson here mm. has an E, and with black ink, it's been crossed out. So, mm. the first edition freak is not only looking for his first edition, mm. he's looking for a first edition with a dust wrapper, he's looking for a first edition with a corrected dust wrapper, <laughs> a corrected E, mm -hmm. crossed out like that, possibly done by Tolkien, mm -hmm. not sure. And then, he's looking for a nice inscription, like this, and then, possibly a letter. He's got everything. <laughs> mm. So, um, what do you think it's worth? Have you had it? Yeah, I've never obviously. had it valued. I have it's absolutely your, you know, it's a no family idea. Thing. You don't really, you don't really want to mm. think too much further than that. I would say that this would fetch at auction, or some collector would be very happy to pay three and a half thousand pounds for it. Wow, that is amazing. It is, isn't it? Mm. Good. I really am surprised to hear that. <laughs> Has this picture been in your family for a long time? Uh, yes, it has. Over a hundred years. It. Um, it came down to my brother from a maternal grandfather, and we think it's one that he bought in Holland. Um, an old man in Holland was bedridden, and he had a lovely collection of pictures, which, and he had a new picture put at the end of his bed every day to look at. But when he became very old, he decided to sell the collection. And my grandfather and another friend went over and bought up the entire collection and divided it between them. And we think this is probably one of those, because Dutch pictures at the time were out of fashion, and he got them very reasonably. And so um, we think all the Dutch pictures came from him. Really? Well, it is a lovely picture, and um, as we can see here from the label, Hermann Swanefeld, uh, it is indeed by him. Labels yes. can very often be misleading, yeah. but in this case, this picture is absolutely genuine. 
Um, this can be backed up by this charming little monogram here, which is quite difficult to see, but uh, which is H and then an intertwining V and S, which is typical for uh, Swanefeld. But besides that, it is very typical of the artist's work. He was, I don't know whether you know, but he was a Dutch painter of the 17th century, born around 1600. Uh, he was a pupil of Claude Lorraine, and like a lot of Dutch painters of that era, the Golden Age, um, he came to Rome and painted there. A lot of painters from Holland did exactly the same thing. And they were all, a lot of them were very influenced by Claude Lorraine, who was an immensely influential landscape painter. And as a result, a lot of these Dutch paintings have a very Italian look about them. Regarding the quality of the picture, I think it's uh, variable, but on the whole, very nice. I think this figure here is particularly particularly well painted, yeah. uh, whereas perhaps uh, other uh, areas of the painting are not quite so good. So perhaps some of the cattle here are a little bit weak and the rendering of the water is perhaps not quite as good as it might be. Um, well, I think a picture in this sort, of, uh, this sort of condition, which is rather dirty and has obviously been in a private collection for a long time, could well be worth in excess of £15,000 today. Yeah, Possibly more. Yeah. And are these part of a collection of yours? No, they came out of an actual fireplace in the house. Uh, your house? Yes, in St. Bees. In St. Bees. How many were there? There's about 14 complete and some with some chips and some broken. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yes. Do you know anything about their age or anything? No, no, no. Not really. Well, uh, this one here is signed Sadler Liverpool, mm -hmm. and that is the maker, uh, or rather the printer of these tiles. And they were, in fact, um, made in Liverpool in the middle of the 18th century, just after. In 1756, he actually swore an affidavit that he and his partner, uh, Guy Green, printed as many tiles in six hours as a hundred skillful pot painters could actually paint. So it was a first very you know, successful manufacturing process. Uh, and then they continued to, to manufacture these for uh, houses and like your fireplace and so on. Uh, they're now very rare, very collectible. Um, this one is a lovely picture. You've got the sailor's farewell. You can see she's crying as she uh, lover goes out to sea and then she's coming back here and he's giving her a present of a watch and so on. And that's probably, the one the sign one is probably Society of Foresters or something like that. But I say they are rare and each one of those, at least £100 possibly 120 and the signed one very nearly 200 mm -hmm. so when you get it home get your calculator out and work it out <laughs> but it's well over 2,000 pounds I would have thought for those you rescued so tell your husband it was worthwhile doing well I like that very much it, it sort of fits my wrist like a glove the wristwatch market is quite an interesting phenomenon of the last few years and it's influenced by all sorts of different factors, size, shape, material, what the watch does, who made it. Mm. This has a number of characteristics that actually put it in the, the area of the, of the better end of the market. <clears throat> First of all, it's, it's rectangular or square in the shape of the dial, but it's a rectangular watch. It's in white gold. It is unusually flat. And if we can open the movement, and I've got a knife here, which uh, I'm sure we're going to be, have a hundred letters <laughs> <laughs> saying... <laughs> here we go. If I can just take this delicate little instrument to open it here. Normally I can open it with my fingers, but uh, this one has a very, very tight case. There we are. Now we're done. All right. We can look at the movement, which again is an important consideration. And here we've got immediately one can can notice that it's actually got one particular little detail that makes it rather special. It's actually a minute repeating wristwatch. Mm. It's not unique. They made a number of them. Mm. Uh, not specifically this firm, but mm. certain firms, Vacheron Constantin, Patrick Philippe, made minute repeating wristwatches. Mm. And Goubelin were more retailers than manufacturers. They actually had watches specifically created for them to sell. And this is the name on this watch, Goubelin of Lucerne. Now, the particular movement here is, is 29 jewels. It's beautifully finished, machined decoration all over it. Uh, it's adjusted for seven positions. That means temperatures, seven adjustments on it, rather. That means for temperature, for positions, and for various different types. And seven is almost as many adjustments as they make. That means the watch was tested before it was delivered in various positions and at various different temperatures. The, the actual train of wheels here is made out of a gold alloy. And this unique little feature 
where actually when I pull the lever on the side, the hours, the quarters and the minutes on the two gongs. Now people have actually faked these watches in the past. Mm -hmm. They've taken round movements and fitted them into rectangular cases or taken miniature pocket watch movements mm -hmm. and fitted them into cases. In this case, I'm absolutely sure there's no problem at all. The case, the back of the case has the same number as the watch itself. It has yeah. the proper Swiss 18 carat mark for white gold and the small punch of the head, which is the control mark. Mm -hmm. And it's signed Gubala and it's signed Gubala on here. The strap I'm not so sure about. Uh, that is white gold also, but it doesn't bear the same marks, and I think it might have been fitted later. Mm. Fascinating. Do you ever wear it? No. no. So, Wouldn't dare. <laughs> give me a little clue as to how you got it. Well, it's my father's and his father's before. His father's. So it's not sort of, you're not collectors or anything? No, 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 just had it in the family, you know, all my life, you know. Well, I, s I suppose you'd like an idea about it. Oh, bad idea. <laughs> You've put me in a bit of a spot there because uh, this has been a strong market in recent months and years and I hope it'll continue. But I think at the moment I'd have to say that this would not be worth less than £50,000. What? <laughs> joking. I'm not joking at all. <laughs> I'm glad you brought it in. It's made my day. <laughs> it's made mine as well. <laughs> what a pretty piece of furniture from the... 1780s, 1790s. Really? Oh, absolutely. Pure Sheraton in design. And of course, the latest fashion at that time was to show off all these exotic timbers. You've got this sort of parquetry design. Do you know what they're all called? Do you know all these names? I should imagine there's something like uh, Amboina, Rosewood, that oh, sort of thing. Oh, very good. Is it? <laughs> yes, absolutely. There's Thuya Wood, and there is Rosewood, and that is probably Kingwood. And oh, they're just all of the new exotic timbers that were being imported from the East and the West Indies, and it was fashionable to show them like this, to give this lovely diamond effect on the top. The rest of it, in striking contrast, is this very black rosewood, just a very dense black colour, contrasting at that time with white stringing of boxwood or sycamore, either white or green, and then the black, and so elegant. Little taper legs, very smart thing. And then it opens up to make a games table. Now, I've never seen one without a, a loper. There's usually something to support. Because obviously people are going to put their elbows on, I would have thought. Anyway, it's as it was, totally original. And you've got a checkerboard top which you lift off, oh, backgammon underneath. And if you wanted to play ordinary cards, there it is, a multi-purpose table. I thought table. it was good that that hadn't been moth-eaten or anything. Well, I think so too. I doubt very much, though, you know, if that's the original. This is, a, this is sort of 1890s cloth. I see. Uh, the, the original would have been a, a coarser weave than that. Yes. And a greyer colour. Yeah. Sorry but about that. Never, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we'll forgive it that. The original leather here, though, my goodness. I wonder how many fortunes have been won and lost on that. Now, tell me the, the family history with this. It originally came into the family through somebody who was either the secretary or the valet to the Duke of Wellington. Really? And when he got married, the Duke of Wellington gave him this and a set of willow patterned, uh, a, a tea set, a willow patterned tea set. My cousin said that she very well remembered when she was a young girl. Her father was playing whist, I suppose it would have been in those days. Um, lost. Yes. You must never lose at cards. <laughs> he had a bad temper, picked up the original playing cards that they were playing with, which had gone with the table always, and chucked the whole lot in the fire. Oh, how dreadful. What a shame. So that's sad. Yes, it is sad. But on the other hand, it's a part of history. That's right. And it's a reflection of the times and the character of the person. Mm. And as long as you keep the story with the table, yes. you should write that down. I have. Excellent. Then and tuck it in, in the table so that That's it. in a hundred years' I time, when we out, do this again... I took it out <laughs> when I brought it here. Oh, excellent. Oh, well, then I'm telling you what you've already done. That's excellent. Well done. But such a pretty table. And with family history, which makes such a difference. Provenance is so important today. 
it is sufficiently valuable that if it got damaged or stolen, then you should have some form of, 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 of compensation by insurance. And for insurance purposes, it's eight and a half thousand pounds. Thank you to the Duke of Wellington. Do you have any background information about this picture? Well, all I know is a letter so Mrs. K, way back in 1900, claimed that one of the ladies was her great-grandmother. And then, about the 1920s, a Mr. K wrote from Calcutta, wanted to know what had happened to Mrs. K, because he thought she had the original dra draft of this picture. And, but after that, it seems to have died the history. Yes. Um, and so, therefore, we think it's of the K sisters, do we? Uh, well, what, yes. One was Mrs. Her, her great grandma, and the other was a Mrs. Robin had become a Mrs. Robinson. Yes. And was there any indication at all of, of an artist at all? Any? Well, uh, apparently, at the time, it was claimed to be a Romney, but in this correspondence, that was denied, and it was said the Mrs. K claimed that it was a, a Lawrence because the ancestors had the original drawing, yes. which he was trying to trace. Well, that's very interesting. You mention here two of the main British portrait painters of the yeah. 18th and 19th century, mm -hmm. uh, following on from Gainsborough and Reynolds. And in my opinion, uh, I don't think it's by either of those two artists. Uh, and the reasons I would say, first of all, taking Rumney, um, is that the brushwork is, is quite different in this yeah. painting from uh, anything that Rumney ever did. He tended to use rather angular brush strokes um, and uh, this in no way has that sort of brushwork. No. Uh, likewise, Lawrence, who was another very, very great painter, yeah. uh, had very, very flashy brushwork, uh. sort of sparkling. And, uh, uh, and this picture, uh, in my opinion, again, uh, is probably most likely by an artist called Sir William Beechey, who is a lesser known artist, mm -hmm. uh, and in some ways perhaps a rather duller painter. Uh, he's a very uh, rather conservative in his brushwork yes. and uh, this picture I think um, if you look at the details of it you can see the way the hands are painted and it's it's perfectly competent but it doesn't perhaps have the um, the extra bit that uh, artists like Rumney and Lawrence had mm -hmm. um, it's really in my opinion very typical of his work and I would think in terms of date we're looking at something executed probably at the turn of the century, around 1800, that sort of thing. Yes. Um, it is really a very, very nice painting. Um, I notice one thing that perhaps bothers me a little bit on first inspection, and that is that this hand sticking out of here um, perhaps doesn't quite work. Um, it, it's, it's rather sort of curious the way it sort of peeps through there, but I don't think he's fully understood it. But other details, such as the face here yes. and here, are, are really very nicely painted. Have you ever had any idea what it, what it might be worth? Well, uh, I can't remember the last valuation, but at the time of my grandmother's death, which was before the last war, I, I think none of her pictures were valued at more than five pounds. Yes, but well, since then, I, yes. I had no idea. Well, you, I think it's gone up a little bit no, we since have. then. Um, I would think that a picture like this, um, fully accepted uh, as by Sir William Beechey, is probably going to be worth somewhere in the region of sort of 15, maybe as much as 20,000 pounds. Which is that? Um, well, it's in very nice condition, which yeah. of course is very important, but also it's a very nice subject of two good-looking people. This is very yeah. important. It's really crucial to work out precisely when this bracelet was put together. I've just been talking with our jewellery expert, John Benjamin, and he confirms that the gold mounts with the fittings and the composition, which is a very classical shape, would have been made in the Georgian period. It dates from the end of the 18th century or perhaps around about 1800. And that's really very important because the pieces of glass, which it's formed of, uh, contain decorative techniques um, which weren't reinvented by the Venetians until the middle of the 19th century. Prior to that, they hadn't been made since Roman times. So what we're looking at is a collection of fragments of Roman glass mounted together at the end of the 18th century. <laughs> so, do you know a, a part of its history at all? I don't really. All, all I really know is the fact that uh, it was left to me by my mother. And prior to that, I believe it was given to my mother by an old aunt.
Uh, but apart from that, I would love to know its history. It's just come down in the family yeah. uh, as, a, as, a, as a little piece of jewellery. I mean, when the pieces of glass were discovered, they would have come from archaeological excavations as fragments of wonderful pieces of Roman glass, bowls, jugs and vessels. When they were found, they certainly didn't look like this. When we turned the back over, it shows the unpolished surface. Here is how the glass would have looked. Uh, these little fragments are in their raw state. By being in the ground, glass decomposes and develops a silvery iridescence. As a result, the um, collectors polished them again, and by repolishing, as the Romans had done originally, the colours inside the glass come out, and these are the colours from... Uh, they all date from round about the first century AD. So we're go going back to almost to almost two millenniums, I suppose, ago. Yes. And to think how they did it. I mean, the techniques here really were wonderful um, methods of making glass. The um, patterns, they contain... Well, there's this one here, that's millefiori. Individual canes. You've all seen the glass paperweights, yes. um, which contain little pieces of uh, rods of glass, like coloured mm -hmm. sticks of rock, assembled together. Here, they've made little patterns in the glass and fitted them around. That would have probably been a whole bowl, maybe that pattern all over it. Mm -hmm. Next to it, even more remarkable, we've got um, latticinio. This is individual twists, little um, candy cane twists of one colour glass set within clear. So the yellow glass twisted up and laid down side by side, remelted into the side of a bowl or a jug. And uh, so many techniques which uh, became forgotten. No one knew how they were doing it. Um, the Romans were able to practice so many techniques that we always think of as Victorian ideas because no one knew until then how it was done. Here, right at the end, that last piece um, contains there's a flower head um, and other patterns of little yeah. flowers and beads, all made of coloured glass. Um, they would have rolled that little flower in one coloured glass petals and then melted it all in together to form the patterns. And these would have been marvellous, extremely valuable treasures in their day. Um, the complete bowls were really quite wonderful. Um, very <laughs> few survive in intact condition. A few have come from excavations complete. They were normally repolished and put on display in the museums. But collectors were glad to hold just fragments of them because even the little pieces are scarce and they show the technology that the Roman glassmakers invented and then the techniques became lost for a long, long time. I mean, these pieces which were assembled, they were shaped to fit into a nice piece of jewellery and here a collector has had this made at a time when there was a great deal of interest in the um, Roman world. Um, the excavations at Pompeii had been working, maybe some of these fragments had come from excavations like that. Who knows, this might have been part of a suite of a match matching necklace and another bracelet once. That's often how these came in the 18th century. To think the pieces are even older and we've got a very valuable piece of jewellery. Because it has value for two reasons. The glass pieces are precious. Even fragments of these rare glass are valuable because the complete bowls are worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. They just don't exist. Um, very rarely come on the market. Even fragments are worth hundreds of pounds each. Some of these pieces alone can be worth well, many hundreds of pounds. Adding those up together, we've got a fair bit, and mounted in such a wonderful way in a period piece of jewellery, which is so smart, um, somewhere perhaps 6,000 to 10,000 pounds. <laughs> Heavens. It's just love. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> I definitely won't wear it now. I must say, these are really wonderful sculptural objects. There's very little else you can say, except they are marvellous pieces of sculpture. They are, of course, salt cellars, in fact. It's what ah. they were designed to do. Now, these were made by this very famous goldsmith called Paul Storm. Three of them were made in 1813, and this one um, was made, actually, in 1811. And you can see a date letter Q there, as opposed to all the rest which have a date letter S for 1813. Um, Paul Storr was a remarkable goldsmith, probably the best native goldsmith this country ever produced. Made absolutely breathtaking things. He started um, his working life in about 1792 and retired, I think, in about 1835, 36, something like that. The, the design for these probably originates in the 16th century. Uh, there's a very famous salt cellar 
made for Francis I by Bienvenuto Cellini. But I think the design that Paul Storr, who made these, will have seen and slightly got a feeling for was actually at Windsor Castle. At Windsor Castle, there are some uh, sauce boats and salt cellars made by a man called um, Nicholas Spremont in the 1740s that have very much this idea of shells being held by sculptural uh, mermaids, mermen, tritons, and so on. And I think that he will have seen those because he worked for a firm or worked with a firm that worked very largely for um, George III. And he will have seen those at, at Windsor Castle, probably even repaired them from time to time. And I think this is where he will have got the general idea. Where did you get them? Well, my father gave them to me about a year, 18 months before he died. The, the, the gilding on them is so wonderful. It's so thick and heavy. Um, and the, and the, 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 just the quality of the work. Everything is absolutely brilliant. They're not worn. All the chiseling on, on the little mermen here is absolutely brilliant. They are really tremendous, tremendous sort sellers. Um, have, you, have you any idea of you know, what do you think they're worth? I haven't any idea whatsoever, no. no. Well, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's difficult. I see. It's difficult, but I, I've been looking at these and um, telling you bits about them and uh, trying to think myself. But I think on balance, if, if I had to buy these, um, either from a private house or at an auction or whatever, if I had to buy them, I think I'd have to be looking at £40,000. Good luck. You do surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what date this is? No, I don't know. I know how long ago I bought it. I bought it 30, 35 years ago. It, to me, is a very classic part of English furniture history, 1820s. Is it? Late Georgian... I didn't know that. No. ...regency. Um, so it's typical of that regency period. I mean, the end of the Georgian period, beginning of the Victorian period. So when things were starting to get a bit fussy, but I'm not going to call this fussy at all, because it's right at the time when things were very, very, very elegant indeed. I like the shape of it. I like the, the, the mass, the size of it is very nice and generous. Um, but you've had it 30 years. I mean, what about this colour? I mean, we've got a bit of a contrast in colour. If I start here, it's very, very faded, where it looks like it's been in a bay window. And then... Yes, it, it has been in a bay window. Yes. And I go all the way round yes. yeah. to when I get to you. It's... Um, Almost a, well, the natural colour, isn't yeah. it? Yes. John didn't like the curtains being drawn, mm. so he, uh, so he had, it's a, it's stood in the sun. It's a working table. And it was the morning sun, which I think right. is supposed to be worse. Um, well, it's it's it hasn't helped. I mean, it's no. it's, it's quite a no. nice colour. Yeah. It's lovely timber. I have a feeling that it might be Scottish. Whoever made this knew what he was about. An Edinburgh maker, Glasgow maker, who could afford a very good quality. You know the timber. I don't know the timber it's made of, no. Well, it's... Oh. Is it mahogany, mahogany or not? That's it. Yeah. You do know the timber. Yeah. Mahogany. Beautiful mahogany. Very, very nice indeed. Um, I mean, what, what have you had? The, have you had it valued? It's a great piece of furniture. I like it. Yes, but uh, I had it valued and I didn't believe the valuation on it at all. Mm -hmm. Because I've put too much on it, what I thought it was worth. That's an unusual way round. May yes. I ask you what they put on it then? What do they put on it? They put 35,000 on it. Well, fairly recently, or yes, must have been. Yes, yeah. about a month ago, Ooh. two months. That's, that is too much, I'm afraid. Yeah, I know. That I've is too much. Yeah. I mean, it's a great-looking table. What I think makes a huge difference to this table, unfortunately, it's a working table. Did you put this leather on? It was put on before I bought it. We didn't put it on ourselves, no. Because somebody has, I'm afraid, made a big mistake with this. This was never designed to have a leather top. No, mm -hmm. all right. This is not a cross-banded edge. This is a solid mahogany all the way around. Yes. And what somebody's done, it was a solid slab of mahogany or veneer of mahogany going right across the whole table, mm -hmm. and somebody has cut it out quite nicely to let a leather top in flat. Mm. Yes. So it would have been originally all this lovely mahogany, figured mahogany. If it was made to have a leather top, well, it would have had what's called cross banding, so the grain would be in different directions. Mm -hmm. It would be this way around here, the grain running like that, and then pointing down towards the back of the piece. 
Yes. So that's the giveaway with this. Yes. And that is going to make a huge difference to the value. That, ought, I'm afraid, I've already taken quite a bit off your 35,000 right, yeah, result yeah. of that. So I didn't believe it myself. <laughs> well, I think you were right instinctively. <laughs> but just before I value it, look at that base. I mean, isn't that fantastic, the edge of this? I mean, that when yes. it stands and you look at it, this great big corbel base here, this trestle support with an anthemion or honeysuckle from Greek art. This is a Greek revival of the 1820s. And these lovely poor feet with these great shells holding the feet together. I think it's a great looking piece of furniture. Yes. I can see somebody like it, I can see you falling in love with it, and I can see you using it and enjoying it. But we have to revalue it, I'm afraid. Right, right. Yeah. Minimum of 10, possibly 12,000 yes. is yes. more realistic. Yes. Because it's great. Yes. And you've obviously had fun over the last 30 years. But what did you pay for it then? When I bought it, I paid 600 pounds for it. Oh. If only we could all go back in time. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Right, thank you. Thank you. And what you've got here is a pilot's watch. Pilot's watch. Yeah. Pilot's watch. Yeah. So in fact, if you actually put it, it's somewhat large yeah. for right. everyday yeah. wear. And they were worn outside, probably on a big leather or fleece flying jacket. Yeah, right. And you wore them yeah. with a long strap actually outside, so you yeah. could read it when you were in the cockpit. Yeah. And it, the date of this one, uh, we'll see inside, there should be. The marks of Omega, the manufacturer, the numbers, but there's also the import hall marks. Yeah. And the letter R, which I think is 1912. Yeah. So basically, it's a First World War pilot's watch. Yeah. And hence the, the very clear white dial with the black numbers. Have you heard this valued? Um, well, tell me where you got it, actually. It's quite well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you where I got it. I bought it off a chap that was dealing in bric-a-brac in Newport Market in South Wales some um, 20 years ago, 22 mm -hmm. years ago. and. There was trouble with the watch, it wasn't keeping time, it was stopping, so he said, if you let me have it back, he said, I know a man that can get it fixed, but you'll have to pay. What did you pay him? Um, oh, what is it, it was 70 or 80 pounds, and I think I gave him about a tenner to get it fixed, which was a lot that's, of money. That's a lot of money. Yeah. 20 mm. years ago. Yeah, 20 years ago, yeah. Mm. Well, as a watch, it's probably worth, in fact, more like a couple of thousand or so. Yeah. But, this is a repair bill. Yeah. Yeah. 1933. Yeah. Made out to a T.E. Shaw of Clouds Hill, Morriton and Dorset. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Do you know who he is? No, I haven't got a clue. It's Lawrence of Arabia. Good God. If I'm correct. Yeah. After the First World War. Yeah. He was a somewhat of a complex character. Mm. And he rejoined, I think. Didn't he rejoin the RAF under the name of Shaw? Yeah. And I think he was killed under the name of Sean his motorcycle when dressed in RAF Good kit. God. To be honest, to be perfectly honest with you, I always thought he was a fiction of car um, a character of fiction, I did. No, no, no. no. It's the, it's the T.E. Lawrence of, well, as Good you say, God. of the marvellous film, yeah, well, and I who wrote the, the book. Yeah, I remember seeing the film years and years ago. But, um, but I reckon that, and he lived, I'm sure. Yeah, my recollection is he lived at Clouds Hill yeah. in Dorset. Good God. And it's actually his watch probably returned to him in 1930, having been cleaned, under the name, the pseudonym that he'd adopted. Good God. So, a yeah. um, couple of grand, couple of half grand, as just as a watch, yeah. how much you could add for the Lawrence connection, I don't know. He's one of the most fascinating characters of the early part of this century. Yeah. I would, it, it's a guess. I'd double that, maybe yeah. five, maybe ten. Good God. I'd better get it in short. <laughs> <laughs> Now, tell me exactly why you brought this brooch to the Antiques Roadshow. Well, I was told it was valuable, but I wasn't just sure, and I came to get the truth. The truth? The wow. Truth. Well, the truth, as you know, has to be used with great economy in life, and I'm going to tell it to you just as it is. What were you told about the stones in this brooch? Well, I was told it was a brown diamond. Mm -hmm. Well, they were absolutely right. It's a brown diamond and white diamonds at either end. And in a way, it's rather remarkable for that. We don't see coloured diamonds very often in life. To be perfectly honest, we don't see rather large diamonds in life very often, uh -huh. do we? Uh -huh. Tell me, whose was it? It was an aunt of mine, mm -hmm. and she was the same name as myself, mm -hmm. so I heard it. Well, that's wonderful, isn't it? I'm just lucky you did have the same name, actually. We <laughs> might have bypassed you. And it's not something one would want to bypass in life, because it's a very, very glamorous object indeed. I think it's worth saying about diamonds is that the white diamonds is what people really want. Blue-white diamonds, even better. Uh -huh. Then, 
when they look inside, they want to see it absolutely flawless in the inner depths of the stone, and they'll use a diamond glass to determine that, using quite a, a high magnification to look into the inner recesses of the stone. Uh -huh. And then, of course, they look for sheer size in, in, in diamonds, and this is a very respectable size. It's probably about two carats, something of that sort. And it's a curiosity. Uh, have you ever seen a brown diamond before? No, and my aunt wore it, and she said it wasn't a diamond. Well, I'm absolutely... She said, that's not a diamond. Well, I'm absolutely confident that it is, and, um, and, and it's a very exciting thing for me to see, actually. It is, of course, the hardest material known to man. It scratches every other material in the planet, and there's a guide to hardness called Moe's Guide of Hardness, where every stone is used to scratch another stone. The diamond is at the top of that, resplendent at the top. Whatever you do to it, you cannot scratch it. Mm -hmm. And then second on Moe's scale is the sapphire, and the diamond is seven times harder than the second layer down. But what we can say is that this is a remarkable thing to find today, and to tell you also that the cutting of the diamond is an, a 19th century, late 19th, perhaps early 20th century cut, and it's been put into a brooch rather later on, so it lived in another jewel before, as indeed its little partners at the end did. And it's a shawl pin for, for a very elegant lady in about 1900. Uh -huh. So a remarkable object in every sense of the word. That's so we've got different. to get down to the nitty gritty, the nitty gritty <laughs> hardness of diamonds and get down to hard facts about finance. Go home, ring up the insurance company and say you want to cover it for £2,500. Uh-huh. Right. That's super. Surprise. Super. That's super. Uh -huh. Good. It's beautiful, isn't it? Look at it gleaming in the gleam of gold there. Uh, this is actually a brooch, but mm -hmm. it broke, so mm -hmm. I use it as a necklace, but Every... I will have it repaired one day. It's worth it, I think. Um, They're rather fascinating, aren't they? Were they your great-grandmothers? They were my great-grandmothers, yes. yes, and came down to me. From, from Germany? From Germany, yes. Mm -hmm. But I think what's significant about this jewellery is that it's made of, of filigree and granulation, Yeah. which is um, typical of all types of folk jewellery from the Mediterranean up to the North Countries and Denmark and Scandinavia. The bracelet itself is a later addition because the colour of the gold is different and the phrasing that of the metal. Is. Yeah, I wonder so, why. And the, yet there are holes here for stitching or at least some kind of textile. And I, I, it's my idea that this was once a hair bracelet, that there was tightly woven lock of hair supporting this bracelet. Around Imagine, it? Around it. And this is what we very often find, that of course this is perishable and wears out, yeah. and yet a gold clasp remains. Mm -hmm. And so they string it onto perfectly sensibly a later gold bracelet. Yeah. But hair, I'm pretty certain that it was, actually. Oh, that's interesting. It, it's an idea we're totally at odds with in the 20th century. It but must have been strong hair. Well, I think it was. <laughs> I think it really was. Well, good good Teutonic hair, you see, that's what we want. But anyway, um, they're, they're marvellous survival. But oddly enough, having opened your little Pandora's box of, of jewellery here, it's not the jewellery that you have in the case that's interesting me, but it's the necklace you've got round your neck. Can, we, can you take that off? Yes. Let's have I a really good look. I thought it belongs to what? You thought it belonged, it became part of it? Yes. Yes, I think it's not actually because part. Because it's similar. The clasp, if you look yeah, at it, yeah. it's similar to... Well, it's decorated again with, with, with these tiny granules of gold, which gold is the most mysterious um, commodity because you can solder granules of the tiniest, tiniest dust-like um, proportions to the surface of gold and give it this, this very interesting mm -hmm. texture, and that's been going on since very ancient times. And these have erroneously been called muff chains. They're not, they're not muff chains. They, they, because they were long, it was assumed that a muff would hang on it and put your hands through it. And oh, it's quite nice to be able to sort of demolish that terminology once and for all, because they simply are not muff chains. They're simply there for decoration. It dates from about 1840. And it's this one that's really disproportionately valuable, because complicated gold jewellery, not easy to wear in the 20th century. And these two, um, fascinating as they are, they're worth low hundreds of pounds, say, mm -hmm. 350, 450 for the clasp alone, and with the bracelet, 500 pounds. But this one, put it down on your little inventory for 2,000 pounds. Surprised? Yes. Good. Do you know who all these people are? Yes, this is my great-great-grandfather and his family. Uh, this was painted about 1820. Um, they lived in Leith, 
just outside Edinburgh. It's, it's a really amazing picture. I think it's so nice, very intimate. But it is nice, and we're very fond of it, but the trouble is we've no idea who the artist was. Ah, well, there, I might be able to help you, because it was exhibited in the Scottish National Gallery in 19... 1956. Yes. At which point they attributed it to um, the son of a, a very well-known miniaturist. Yeah. Uh, the son's name being Charles Robertson. It does seem to fit. The date is exactly right, yes. well, uh, within a year of what yes, you suggested. Yes. And uh, also, the idea of it being by a miniaturist explains uh, quite a few things about this picture that, uh, that, that intrigue you otherwise. Yes. For example, there's a sort of clumsiness in the perspective um, and the yes. technical merit of the picture yes. that makes you think not, that not the, the artist wasn't used to painting such big pictures. There is a school of thought that he painted one head and put it on all the... Oh, yeah, I, uh, I think he would have had to stay with your family for quite some while before he'd finished this picture. It would have taken him, I feel, months. It's got that kind yes. of meticulous attention to detail as well Possibly, that a yes. miniaturist painter might yeah. use. Mm -hmm. And one of our experts has identified this toast rack yeah. as the uh, Robert and Cadman patent expanding toast rack, oh, patented in 1807. <laughs> Such is the detail that he can tell that. All these figures are really well arranged. You've yes. got this, this lovely kind of compositional circle going on yes. of glances and looks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole thing finished off by the father, who's got a look of slight dismay on his face. And I think I'm it's... I'm not surprised. I, yeah, I, not, <laughs> not as much as her look of dismay. Well, I think that's uh, a look of resignation, isn't it? Yes, it, it has uh, to be. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, he's, I think he's actually looking across to uh, one of his sons here yes. and he's saying, don't you bring that dead duck in here. He's dripping blood all over the carpet. <laughs> but what I really like about this picture is the, um, is the faces of each of the children. I think their yeah. characters are all immediately identifiable. On the whole, a, a ravishing picture, a real cross-section of life as it must have been. But artistically not... Well, I, well, it doesn't worry me. I mean, uh, I, I like it. Yes, technically, technically perhaps it falls yes. down in some ways, but yes. it's so charming it transcends all of that. I yes. think. Yes. And um, to put a value on the picture, well, now that is difficult because, of course, um, the artist doesn't have really a, no. a good track record in the marketplace. Although we don't really mind who it's by, yeah. it's such a wonderful slice of it's life nice, yeah. mm -hmm. that it's got to command fifteen thousand pounds. I think it could even go up to £20,000, and perhaps more. Goodness. But I wouldn't replace it. You couldn't replace it? Well, I couldn't, replace, couldn't replace it, replace no. It uh, it's the most wonderful picture. Now, Lord Chumley, um, of all the wonderful things that are on display in the public parts of the house, these items have come from the private apartments, haven't they? Yes, this was, has always been in the hall, the entrance hall downstairs, and um, under one of the mahogany tables and used as a, as a, a waste paper basket, I'm afraid. <laughs> with, <laughs> with a side of Very practical. <laughs> <laughs> you could always put a liner in it, I suppose well, you could. want to do that. Uh, there should be a pair to it. There is a pair. There is yeah, a pair. Yeah, That's the another, other side. The, the other, other side. Waste paper basket. <laughs> <laughs> You're coming in or going out of the I house. Um, um, well, they're plate buckets. That accounts for the fact that, that, that it has a gap so that you can lift the plates in and out. And they were carried from the kitchen to the dining room yes. in pairs. Um, and carried on a yoke. So you did, I mean, they're so heavy anyway, like that's quite heavy pails. with that. Yes, yes. Uh, milk pails. So uh, they've sort of carried them mm. in, in pairs. This is rather a nice size one, and probably for dessert plates rather than dinner plates. Right. It's got a particularly pretty little uh, brass mount around here, which is sort of 1810 to 1815. Um, which is about the right date for these things. They, they sort of tended to go out of fashion by about 1830 mm. and weren't introduced as such until the sort of 1780s, so they're a fairly short lifespan. Um, and their value, I mean, in pairs usually today between six and eight thousand pounds, depending on really? their size and quality. Um, but of course, as soon as you have a provenance like this yeah. great house, Mm. Then, then prices can make anything because in the future it means that someone's going to own it and say, well, this came from Haddon Hall. Yes. So I think it, we have to ignore the provenance side and say um, a pair of these should be insured for, say, seven and a half to eight thousand pounds. Really? But as right. their provenance me makes them unique, then uh, they couldn't be replaced. Well, I think so. 
we should, certainly shouldn't be using this waste paper. Well, I <laughs> should <laughs> find another use. Put a few plates in just to remind you what yes, they're for. Exactly. And then we have they're this lovely. extraordinary, extraordinary wassail bowl, which is made of one of the most dense timbers known, which is lignum vitae. If you threw that into the lake, it would sink. Really? Oh, yes, it, it, really? it, it does not yeah. float. And this was a wassail at Christmas time, and you toasted your friends. They're almost big enough to get into, isn't it? Like a sort of punch. Of Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sure. With apples and alcohol yeah. and all sorts of things. I mean, it really is a stunning piece. It's one of the largest I've ever seen. There is one maybe a tad bigger, but if not, certainly the same size in the Victorian Albert Museum, really? which has a crisscross pattern cut onto it and the original fitments to go in those yes. little holes. Which and were, those were little yeah. cups with a spike on. And I suppose... Uh, 1640, this was made. Really? Yeah. Early. Yeah. Very early, yeah. yes. yes. Where does this live, by the way? This lives by Sir Robert Walpole's desk in the library. Um, it doesn't have any purpose. <laughs> it just sits there. <laughs> Don't sort of and throw anything wondered, into this, eh? No, well, I, I suppose <laughs> with a lid. But, um, but it, does, it stands on the floor. But really, it should, uh, should be exhibited. Uh, this, in today's market, could easily make £25,000. Really? Yes. Yeah. So pop it on a table now. Definitely. I bought it in one of these antique centres in London about a year ago. Yeah. It was a case of love at first sight. Love at first sight, yes. It was uh, a pattern that I already have in two other pieces. Right. Um, nothing on the size of this. I managed to persuade the colleague I was with that I needed it. I couldn't quite afford it at the time. Oh, so... that, was a, that was a problem. You wanted it, but you couldn't afford it. No. How, how did you resolve that? Well, I bought one half of it. You bought a half? Yes. Wh which half is yours? The front side. Oh, the front half is yes. yours. <laughs> with the intention that if it was worth its value later on, yes. I could actually acquire the second half. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I, I suppose... Right at the start, then, we need to know what your half cost. £800. £800 for half of the vase. I think it's the finest Carltonware vase that I've seen. There is some printed work at the top of the vase, but when we come down through this lovely willow tree to the handwork on the bird here, with each separate feather colour applied by hand, you know, we can see that it's a, a magnificent piece of work and has taken hours and hours of time to do. Mm -hmm. Let's turn it round just to look at the design all the way round. We'll see that this wonderful bird is on the other side, caught in flight. It's almost a, a photographic image of it. It's absolutely wonderful. And the shape, after a Chinese shape, is absolutely gorgeous. Down the inside of the vase, we have these lustres, which Carlton Ware were, were famous for. Yeah. They're luster glazes. But unusually, for this quality of vase, they haven't used much luster work on it. This vase was made about 1928. Yes. Um, it's a rare pattern. It's very unusual in size. So for all the reasons that you fell in love with it, you know, they're all the right reasons, mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a wonderful object. Carlton Ware is just becoming more and more collectible at the moment. Mm -hmm. People are really beginning to appreciate the quality of the work, which by the 1920s was as good as anyone. Mm -hmm. I think if you put this into an auction at the moment, into an auction, you would get £3,000 for it. For that size? £3,000 for that at vase. At this current moment? At this stage. Gosh. It's a great object. So, so it is worth acquiring the second half then. <laughs> You know, I'm most amazed to see an American knife here today like this. This particular knife is very, very sought after by American collectors. Um, how long have you had it? 50 years. About plus. 50 years in the family. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, here we have the American Eagle. And on the other side, the motto, which you often see on American coins, uh, E Pluribus Unum. It's a Bowie knife, of course, and there's the typical shaped Bowie. Mm -hmm. 
named after James Bowie, who carried a very similar knife, and so all these knives with clipback blades are known as Bowie knives. But the Americans do like their own knives, and this is very much an American knife. Many Bowie knives were made in Sheffield, and they were shipped through the Hudson Bay Company and for trappers and hunters in America. But this is an American-made one, and of course very, very desirable in the American uh, knife market. And I, I think you might be surprised to know it has a value of about three thousand oh. <laughs> pounds. You're joking. No, that that is that is and possibly more. Well, I remember my father buying it along with a lot of mess silver. He was a, in the Royal Scots Fusiliers. Right. And the regiment was going to India, and my father retired. That was in 1935, I think. Right. And he bought this and several other pieces, which I didn't keep when he died. I sold them because, quite honestly, insurances and everything else yes. was too much. Yes. But I've always loved this. I'm not surprised, actually, because looking at it very quickly, my initial reaction is a spoon warmer. Absolutely. Uh, and then with... you get a big surprise when it, you <laughs> open the lid. <laughs> this is it, because now, a money box? Yes, a swear box on the oh, table. Oh, a swear box? Yes. Oh, is that? Is that... And anybody that swore had to put do you, something Do you know what in they had to put in? No, I don't. <laughs> well, I suppose earlier you could have put a sovereign in. Absolutely, yes. And that would soon add up. I don't up. know what date it is or how old it is, actually. Well, the first of all, of course, the, it does straight away beg the question, is it original or not? The fact that well, it is Well, this is what I'd like to know, yes. Now, it's... And here's another surprise, actually, because normally if you get a spoon warmer of this form, which there are many around... Yes. They're electroplated. Yes. And that's silver. This is silver. Yeah. But there's another surprise, <laughs> because it's Irish silver. Really? So what is the Scottish regiment doing, doing with, with an Irish? Piece of Irish silver? <laughs> I well, wouldn't know. Well, the date of this, here we are, it's Dublin, 1866. Right. There has to be a reason for it. But I know it. definitely it was the swear box. Right. And actually the maker there... Actually, the maker, funny enough, is this, this mark over here, which is the JS. But we've got the name West appearing underneath mm -hmm. there. Yes. And this is something they did in, in Dublin. You would get the maker, as we've got there, and then you'd get the retailer putting his stamp on. Right. Little lock, of course, being the money inside, obviously it has to be locked up. Yes. No key, I'm afraid. It should be pretty easy to find yes, a key. It'll be a, very, it'll be a very basic very key basic, for that. Yes. Um, but interestingly, it's marked also, if you see, in the lid there. Yes. Now, that confirms that the lid is original yes. to the Nautilus shell. Yes. It's, a it's lovely the way they've done the flush hinge Beautiful. there as well. Yes, I think it's lovely. Because had this been a spoon warmer, either it would have been left open... Right. Some do have lids, but they have a slot cut at the front yes. for the spoon. Yes. So this convinces me... That it is a swear box. That it was made as a swear box. Yes. So fascinating object. I have to say it's a very difficult object to put a value on. Have, have you got it insured or anything? It's... Yes, it's... In, uh, it, well, I mean, it's in the household insurance. I haven't... Oh, just... I mean, it's not specified. No, no. no. Um, I suggest you perhaps insure it for somewhere around 5,000. Really? Yes. Well, we are in the seafood business, and this was given to us by a gentleman that was retired and worked for us in, the, in our office. However, he had a very jealous wife, and um, my husband used to take him salmon fishing, and she didn't like this at all. <laughs> and he was due to, to go salmon fishing up to Scotland when he was taken ill, so my husband went on his own. Two days after we'd gone, he collapsed and died. Um, and about a few months later, she said, I've got something for you. So this was the painting. But so was it given as a punishment? She was, she, what happened was, she said, I actually went and sold it. I knew Donald wanted you to have this. But she said, I went and sold it and I couldn't sleep at night. So I had to go and buy it back again. So she went and bought it back from the antique dealers and then gave it to Chris. Yes. So and I don't so know. what do you feel about this? I don't like it. I don't like the eyes, I don't like the mouth, the cat. I just think, but her husband loves it. Well, it was obviously quite a famous picture in the, yes. at the time. It's by Bateman. Um, James yes. Bateman. Because it's called lobster sauce. Lobster sauce, I knew that, yes. yes. And this comes from uh, Germany, really, all sorts of strange animal pictures yes. which are quite cruel yes. through Sir, through Edwin Lancia the, the great animal yes, painter yes, yes. in fact there's a very famous Lancia painting called the cat's paw oh, the cat's... which is which is the monkey using the cat's paw 
to take the hot chestnuts off the burning oh, right. stone. So a similar thing, yeah. Which is very cool. And this, and I think yes. that this picture is very much influenced yes, in that manner. Yes, I can see that. Well, well it's sentimental value. That's why we, you know, we like it because of the man who gave us it. You know, it's just. And a wonderful story. Um, as for value, I would say between four and five thousand pounds. I better tell him. <laughs> He's up in Scotland at the moment, so I'll tell him. He's after these things in Scotland. Yes, yeah, salmon fishing, yes. Yeah, so. You would think he would see enough of them, wouldn't you? But uh, yes, it's his hobby. One story we haven't heard is the, is the one about Harrogate and the Russian royal family jewels. Princess Alex of Hesse, when she was engaged to the, the Tsarevich of Russia, came to Harrogate for treatment for sciatica. And while she was here staying in a boarding house, the landlady gave birth to twins. The Tsarina, the future Tsarina, took this as a good luck omen and insisted that she be godmother to those twins. And she gave a number of gifts at the christening, the cufflinks and the nappy pin that she bought here in Harrogate. And then when she returned to Russia, she sent gifts to the family subsequently, up until the 21st birthday in 1915, when she sent this beautiful gold cross to the male twin. Shortly after that, of course, the, the gifts stopped. Sadly, yes, the uh, Russian family came to a very unpleasant end, and that was the end of that story. But the beginning of our story, because the son of the male twin came to Harrogate in 1993. He had no family, and he wanted these items to be where they would be appreciated and where they had meaning. And of course, here in the Royal Pump Room Museum in Harrogate, they have tremendous meaning. So they've really come home. Yes, they have. They've come home and they tell a very Harrogate story of plumber's son being christened, butcher's son being his godfather, and the future Tsarina of Russia standing as godmother. Sums up the essence of Harrogate in its spa heyday. Mother bought this in a jumble sale about 65, 67 years ago. Oh, wow, right. Yes. In a jumble sale. How wonderful. Yes. Yes. What a thing to find, because it's very heavy to so cart around yes. a jumble sale. I would make the car very I mean, far. it's made of black Belgian marble. Belgium, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Ah, good. Well, it's not Belgian or French. No, no. What, what, what na nationality well, do you think it we is? We thought it was maybe it's Italian. Very clever, but wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's English. Yes. This is made probably on the Duke of Devonshire's estate, the Duke Cha of Devonshire, Devonshire, Chatsworth. Oh, yes. In Derbyshire. Yes, yes. And there's a difference between the, this type of marquetry, which is pietre dure, hard stone inlay, yes. the Italian marquetry, and the English marquetry. Yes. The English is much more complicated, much more difficult to do. This is a solid marble top. Yes. And what's happened is they've cut these little holes in to let this yes. into the main surface. The Italians have a thin veneer of marble on top ah. and cut out a little ah, uh, stencil, yes. if you like, which yes, is yes. an easier, still very difficult, but easier we'll technique be, we'll be than easy. this very typical English technique. Yes. Sort of Ashburton area of Derbyshire. A, a lovely, it's, it's, a, it's a great little marble table. I mean, it's such a pretty size and so fresh because the date, we haven't talked, is about 1840 yeah. or 1840. 50. 1840? Yeah. Ah. It's a lot old. It was already 100 years old or so when it was bought by your family, at least. Yes, yes. yes. Now, I've got to value this because I think it's a great piece of furniture. Insure it for £5,000. 5000 Very nice. Very nice. Well, as far as I know, it belonged to my great grandmother, but. Mm. I don't know anything more about it. She came from Yorkshire, mm -hmm. and I suppose ladies of her status would have worn tiaras quite often and mm -hmm. uh, brooches like that. A, a typical form for a mid-19th century piece of English diamond work, and the, the, technically it, 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 it's interesting because on the back it's of gold, and yet on the front it's set into silver, and it was to be worn in candlelight, and so there wasn't much concern about the front tarnishing, which it does a tiny bit. Um, have you worn it? Does it got um, lots of memories for you? I bet it has. Possibly at army dances, but army I don't dances. go to those sort of things nowadays. Not as a brooch or in your hair? Oh, no, as a brooch. It's a, it's a wonderful, spectacular display of, of natural beauty, isn't it? And very flattering. Wonderful, wonderful thing. It's high Victorian. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's, it's really couldn't be a more elegant form and um, perhaps put it down on your insurance policy for £8,000, something like that? More than you thought? Shall I tell you how much it's on my insurance for? Do, go on. 400 400 Well, it's only 20 times the amount. This is true. <laughs> my cousin has recently died and um, I got these plus a whole lot of other things. 
The watch has a lovely, lovely white enamel dial, yeah. signed Webster of London. Mm. Just look at that case. I mean, that is absolutely superb mm. repoussé work. It is lovely. And so let's just peel that case off, and that'll give us a chance to show you that this is what we call a pair-cased watch, yeah. simply because there are a pair of cases, the outer and the inner. And, and as you know, you wind the thing through the back. Let me have a look inside. Yeah. What a lovely movement. Have you ever seen inside there? I looked in there, yes. Yeah. Absolutely superb. And it's actually signed William Webster Exchange Alley. Got this yeah. lovely, lovely pierced and engraved balance cock. Super baluster pillars. Absolutely what you'd expect for this sort of thing. And here, um, something written there. Well, it's got a set of London hallmarks. I think I could say that that is 1751. Oh, right. Mm. And lovely to see a Chatelaine. Now, of course, this would have been worn on a waistband. Yes. Uh, and although the, the top bit here is gilt, the reinforcement bit, the rest of it is gold. Is it? Yeah. The joy of the chagrin case, of course, and that is shark skin, is it has kept this as mint as you would want. The collectors of repoussé watches want these absolutely pristine in the way that coin collectors want nowhere at all. If you went to a good London retailer who specialised in that sort of thing, with the gold chatelaine, well, I think you've got to think about £8,000. Eight? Eight thousand. Yeah. This is... Uh one of the most magnificent and interesting works by this artist that I've ever seen. Is it? Yes, it is. Pike, yeah. Yes, by Pike, by William Henry Pike, and the date 1874. Yeah. yeah. And it's a view of Clavelli, I think with some license to it as right. well. Um, the interest that the artist has built into this picture is uh, quite incredible. Your eye is taken right across with various centres of interest. Um, the children playing, the high pitch of the houses here indicating the uh, steepness of the streets, the boats and the harbour of course of Clavelli itself. A really good Victorian composition picture. Um, I've never actually seen one as big as this before. My father actually mm. I think got hold of it from a uh, a satisfied client when he was in the property business before the war, before the right. Second World War, uh -huh. and um, it passed to me when he died, and we have it now in our home on, on the whole wall. I would say this was clearly a picture painted for a patron, rather than just a picture that he painted commercially. Sure, sure. Now, it needs restoration, it needs re-canvassing to stabilise these areas of flaking paint, right. it needs cleaning, and it also needs the removal of those at earlier attempts at restoration. Yes, yes. As it stands, value-wise, it's worth between around five and, say, eight thousand pounds today oh, if yes. it were to appear at auction. Yes, yes. Thus is the importance of sure, the picture. Sure, sure. The bracelet is 18 karat gold and it's got an English hallmark on it. Uh, the diamonds, which are, these are all the way around the outside, are what we term as Swiss or eight cuts. That's right. to say they haven't got the same amount of facets as a full brilliant cut diamond. But having said that, uh, the quality is exceptionally good, I think. But it's a nice watch. I mean, it, it was your mother's. No, uh, actually, it was my grandmother's. My grandfather was on the Queen Mary when it first sailed, and the American woman was looking over the top, and her jewellery box fell down the side, and he had to climb over the side. He could have been killed and he managed to salvage the jewellery box and she gave him that in appreciation. How oh, fantastic. Yes, it's a lovely story, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So it's very sentimental, that one. Oh, I'll show you. It must mm. be, yes. But, I mean, a watch like that today, to, to go into a shop to try and buy one, to replace one like that, going to cost you best part three or four thousand pounds. Yes. Thanks for bringing it along. Thank you. Thank you. You're from a local museum, is that right? That's right. The Wheel Martin China Clay Museum near St. Austral. I see. This picture was commissioned by Henry Buckingham Gill of the Trevorian Trevanian estate, a local landowner, and um, the artist was a local artist, Elliot of Newquay, and commissioned and painted in 1892. The scene is a, a china clay pit, as it would have appeared in the late 19th century,
Car Clays, and that's still in existence about a mile up the road from here. It's called so Car Clays. Car Clays trying to tape it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is a mighty pit and, and well worth going to see if you get the chance. Yeah. <laughs> it certainly looks it from the painting. I mean, you get a very strong sense of the scale by these streams going up back through here. And, uh, and that's an aerial little railway, presumably, for taking the, be, um, the rock away. Carrying water, I think. Uh, It'll be an aqueduct carrying water. Carrying water, I see, yes. Um, well, uh, I looked up Elliot, and uh, he exhibited a number of pictures in the Royal Academy. They all seem to be uh, views which are, are very majestic, command a, a, a grand prospect. And you can see that that's what he's tried to do here, to catch that. He's keyed it in very cleverly with just this little wooden trestle here with a single chuff or crow sitting on it. Chuff Ah, OK. <laughs> it's kind of keyed the whole thing right in and gives you a strong sense of the sheer size of the place. Um, it's also, it's in remarkably good condition. The colours have lasted well. So you get a strong impression of at least the artist's idea of how this clay pit looked in those days. I think it's, it's rather rewarding painting. Uh, its value... Something in the region of three thousand pounds would just about cover it. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. It's about right.